and welcome to another Sunday School Lesson Review broadcast for Sunday, December 18th, 2022. The lesson review is taken from Luke, the first chapter, verses 26 through 38. The title of the lesson is God's Promise of a Savior. That is, God's Promise of a Savior. I am your host, Minister William Gadsden, and I greet you in the exalted name of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus that enables us to get the Word of God out to you, the listening public. We originate from the Greater Peace Missionary Baptist Church, located in the Colleen Fort Hood, Texas area. Our address is 4201 Zephyr Road, Colleen, Texas, 76543. You can reach us by telephone at area code 254-680-4378. But if you prefer to reach us online, our website is www.greaterpeace.com. You can also communicate with us by email. Our email address is greaterpeacemdc at peoplepc.com. Now, we at Greater Peace uh, provide a variety of services for your Christian growth. A complete schedule of services and activities can be viewed on our website. So please join us in extending God's kingdom here on earth. Again, I am your host, Minister William Gadsden, and I thank God for you supporting this ministry. Now let us open our lesson with prayer. Lord, we thank you, as always, for all that you've done for us. We thank you for this another day, getting closer to the day that we celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, which the lesson is all of, is the foreground is all about what the coming of Jesus in this lesson. So we thank you, Lord, for the things that you've done for us. Continue to guide us. And help us to grow in understanding you and your ways. Help us to understand and basically read your word more and more. But we know that we can only understand it fully if the Holy Spirit goes with us. So I'm asking all of those that desire to study about study God's word to invite the Holy Spirit with them. But the Holy Spirit will only dwell with them as long as, if they have accepted Jesus as their Savior. So there's one step you have to go. If you, the Holy Spirit's going to be with you and indwell in your heart, you have to accept Jesus as Savior, and then the Holy Spirit will come into your heart. These things I pray and I ask as always in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I am for introduction. This, the lessons for this quarter, the three lessons we've had so far, have provided us information about the birth of John the Baptist, who was the one that was the forerunner of Jesus, and that is, he introduced uh, uh, Jesus to the Israel. And then last week's lesson, we saw that God denied David's request to build him a temple or a house. But he then made a covenant with David announcing the Davidic, Davidic covenant, which stated that David's lineage would continue, uh, would continue eternally. And that Jesus, the Savior, would come through his, the lineage of David. And he would be the last king of uh, Israel. Of David's dynasty, David's kingdom, that is. Today's lesson is focused on Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the events surrounding her being chosen as a woman uh, to bring the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. Now, the birth of Jesus is the final event in God's plan to send a Savior to the world to allow mankind to have a relationship once again, as he promised in Genesis 13, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when he pronounced punishment for Satan and the Savior for mankind. And when he said, and this basically this lesson said, this verse says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, this comes from the Genesis, the third chapter, verse 15. And the woman mentioned here in this, this very scripture is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I would like to read what Matthew Henry said concerning Genesis 3.15. He says, notice is given concerning Christ in this verse. Now, first of all, he says, his incarceration or coming in the flesh, it speaks great encouragement to sinners that their savior is the seed of the woman, born of our bone of our bone. Secondly, it his suffering and death pointed at in Satan's bruising his head. That is this this, this scripture basically saying 
Satan will bruise Jesus' head. That is, his human nature and Christ's suffering are continued in the suffering of saints for his name's sake. And Jesus said this would happen. Uh, the devil tempts them, that is, the, the believers in Jesus prosecute, persecutes them and slays them, and so bruises the heel of Christ, who is afflicted in their afflictions. But while he, the heel is bruised on earth, the head is in heaven, and he has control over everything. His victory over Satan thereby, Christ baffled Satan's temptations, rescued souls out of his hands, and by his death he gave a fatal blow to the devil's kingdom, a wound to the head of, of his servant, of his serpent, of this serpent that is, that cannot be healed. As the gospel gains ground, Satan falls. Now this again taken from Matthew Henry's commentary. Now many are quick to point out that a woman had a part in bringing sin uh, uh, to mankind, but many often forget that a woman also had a part in bringing a savior to mankind. That was Mary. Mary was that woman chosen to bring the savior of mankind into the world. God chose Mary not because she was rich and neither because she was poor. God chose Mary because she was in the lineage of David <laughs> and could fulfill God's covenant with David. And also, she would fulfill God's promise to send a savior who would be the offspring or seed of a woman. Now, the seed of a woman meant that a woman could bear a child that was not created between a union of a man and a woman. The seed of the woman was Jesus Christ because Jesus was born of a woman without the intervention of man. Now, I realize that today uh, women can become pregnant without having a physical relationship with a man, but that type of birth can only occur using the sperm of a man. This was not the case in the birth of Jesus. Such was not the case, as I said, in the birth of Jesus, because the Holy, Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, a, a virgin, and the Immaculate Conception occurred to bring Jesus into the world of mankind and the seed necessary for human birth was implemented into Mary, who was a virgin. And this was a virgin birth. Now God picked a specific time for Jesus, uh, Jesus' birth. Galatians, the fourth chapter, verses four through five describes the time God chose. It says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now this lesson is about an angel, the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary to inform her that she was chosen, the chosen virgin to bring Jesus, the son of God into the world. God sent Gabriel to tell Zechariah that he would have a son in his old age and if you will recall, Zacharias did not believe the message Gabriel gave him, and he was not allowed to speak until John was born because of his unbelief. Now, six months after informing Zechariah of God's plan, God sent Gabriel to Nazareth, the territory of Galilee. Now, during this time, Israel was divided into three territories, Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. Nazareth was not a very important town in the territory of Galilee, but Mary and Joseph lived there, so it was important to God. God sent the angel Gabriel to Mary to inform her of his plans for her. He said to Mary, Hail, thou art spe specifically chosen and favorite of the Most High, and that uh, she would have a child, not just any child, but one sent from God. Now, this wondrous salutation and appearance troubled Mary. The angel had then assured her that she had found favor with God and would become the mother of a son whose name she should call Jesus. That salutation was the thing that appeared to Mary, uh, basically troubled Mary, but uh, his appearance didn't trouble her. His message to her was simple, but it contained complex realities that Mary did not initially understand. Remember, Mary was probably a young girl between somewhere between the ages of 12, 13, 14, maybe 15. 
Gabriel told her that the Holy Spirit would come upon her and the power of the Most High God would overshadow her and she would conceive a child from God. Gabriel was telling Mary that the baby would, she would carry would be of divine origin because the conception of the child would not occur because of human actions, but it would have happened because of interactions by the Holy Spirit. Now, there's no physical interaction between Mary and the Holy Spirit. This was just a thing that was happened. And so Mary did not appear to be frightened by Gabriel's appearance, as I mentioned earlier, and did not ask for a sign confirming that Gabe, what Gabriel said to her was true. But she did not, but, but she did not understand how it was possible for her, a virgin, to have a child when she had had no relationship with a man. Mary's final reply to the angel was a language of faith and humble admiration, and she asked no sign for the confirmation and uh, confirming her faith. This wondrous salutation and appearance troubled Mary. The angel then assured her that she had found favor with God and would become the mother of, the, of a son whose name she would call Jesus. Mary was concerned that others would say if she was betrothed to Joseph and became pregnant before marriage, she was very concerned how she could explain to Joseph, first of all, and what others would say because she knew this would pose a very disgraceful, critical problem for her. Now, if an unmarried woman, even though she was in spouse and became pregnant, the only conclusion would be that she was immoral and should be stoned to death as prescribed by Jewish law. Mary had this in mind. She knew these things, but she still said she would go do what the Lord said to for, asked her to do. Now, if she were to claim her innocence by saying she was a virgin whose pregnancy was caused by the Holy Spirit, the charge of lying, insanity, and heresy could be added and probably would have been. God was aware of what Mary would face once she was discovered to be pregnant and not yet married. Our circumstances may make life circumstances difficult, but this word needs to be moved from our belief system and moved to the reality that nothing is impossible for God. So our circumstances, Mary's circumstance, and she realized it, she said, behold the handmaid of the Lord, I'll do what you say she do. She was chosen by the sovereign decision of God. She was separated out from others to be God's servant for a special task. God often works out his sovereign will by favoring common people like Mary and us also to, spe to do special tasks. God often works out his sovereign will by favoring common people, as I said, like Mary. Uh, the, the focus should never be on us, but on the purpose of God, that God is being accomplished. That the per but the purpose of God, basically the focus should never be on us, but on the purpose of God that is being accomplished through us. Now, Mary had the perfect response with all, the full knowledge that the potential of, for personal embarrassment and disgrace would happen. Mary nonetheless agreed to the plan of God because she said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. When Gabriel heard her words, he left her. Now, no doubt Mary is like us, many of us, that is. No doubt Mary would wake up tomorrow, the next day, that is, with a new set of questions. But who would answer them? Who would uh, walk with her through the days of uncertainty that lay ahead? And the words of the angel would become her assurance. The Lord is with you. When we follow the plan of God, we, we experience a presence and receive the provisions of God to help us through all the things that we go through. And this is the end of my introduction. Now let's get into our Sunday School lesson. It's titled, Obedience and Celebration. The text lesson text is taken from Luke, the first chapter, verses 26 through 38. The golden text is Luke, the first chapter, verse 31. And our lesson sections are, there are three of them. First, an angelic appearance, verses 26 through 30, a divine message, verses 31 through 37, and a humble response, verse 38. 
So, without further ado, uh, do let's get in start get started with our lesson. An, an angelic appearance. Uh, verse twenty six reads, and in the sixth month of sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into the city of Galilee, named Nazareth. Now, the sixth month mentioned refers to the length of time between Gabriel's visit to Zacharias and his visit to Mary. The sixth month also indicates the number of months Elizabeth had been carrying John the Baptist. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus, so Gabriel. Gabriel's visit to Mary occurred six months after his visit to Zacharias. Now, verse 27 says, To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, Zondervan, Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary makes the following comments concerning a virgin during the time of Christ's birth. He says, a virgin was a young, unmarried girl between the ages of 12 and 14 years old. A young Jewish girl would normally be engaged to a man through a marriage contract. This contract was legal and would be drawn up, and the girl would be called her fiancé's wife. The young virgin would continue to live with her parents until the marriage ceremony, which would usually occur a year or so later. Any acts of infidelity would be treated as adultery. And uh, the punishment for adultery was stoning. If you remember what the, when Jesus was there and he was writing, he basically was, they came up to him with the woman that was accused of being caught in the act of adultery. But Jesus said, uh, after everybody left, he says, uh, tell the, lady, the, the one that was accused of adultery to go and, and sin no more. So Mary was a spouse to Joseph. Now this most likely meant that he paid a price for, his, for Mary and they were considered husband and wife, but they did not live together until the, he, the groom, finished preparation for his wife and later came to take her to his home, which usually occurred somewhere in the neighborhood of a year later. Now, one might say Mary was engaged to Joseph and she was waiting for him to provide a home for her where she would go and live with him as they would be living as husband and wife. Now, verse 28 says, An angel came unto her, in unto her, and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now, God sent the angel Gabriel to visit Mary to give her the good news that God had selected her to bring the baby Jesus into the world. When he appeared, he told Mary that she was highly favored and God had selected her to bring the Savior of the world into the world as a little baby. Gabriel said she was blessed because God chose her among, the, among all the women of Israel to be the mother of, of his son, Jesus. Verse 29 says, And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. You see, Mary did not appear to be afraid when Gabriel appeared, as Zacharias was, but she could not understand in her mind the salutation the angel used to greet her, and neither could she understand why an angel was visiting her in the first place. She also wondered why an angel would greet her as blessed among all women of Israel because it was strange for her at this time. And verse 30 says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Now, even though Gabriel urged Mary to have no fear of his appearing, it appears she was not consult, con concentrating on his appearing because she was concentrating on the meaning of what he had said in his greetings. She was thinking, how can I have found favor with God? And why has an angel appeared unto me? She was chosen by the sovereign God, separated out from others to be God's servant for a special task. God often works out his sovereign will by favoring common people like Mary and us in some cases to accomplish his purpose. She was also wondering why she was highly favored with God 
and why she was blessed among women by God. So these are things that the natural, the young girl would probably naturally wonder. Maybe some of us, who, if we got over the fear of an angel appearing to us, might think the same things. Uh, most women would think that because men would not be involved in this situation. Okay, now let's get to our second section. That is verses 31 through 37. And this is a divine message. Third, verse 31 says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Gabriel, inform, Gabriel informs her how this would happen when he told her she would conceive the child in her womb. Now, bear in mind that Mary was probably, as I said, a young girl, somewhere between 12 and 14 years old, that an older man, Joseph, chose approach with a marriage proposal. Uh, they were not physically married, but they were espoused, and no sexual relations could happen until Joseph came to take her to his home. Mary would continue to live with her parents until Joseph, the actual marriage ceremony. Now, since she was not married physically and had had no sexual relations with Joseph, she was puzzled as to how she could bring a child into the world. She wondered and was confused that gave what, what Gabriel said she would conceive at this time a child in her womb. She didn't know how that was going to happen. Verse 32 says, and she, he shall be great, this is Gabriel speaking, and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Now Gabriel begins to tell her about the son she will bring into the world through the Holy Spirit. Gabriel describes the child she will bring into the world by saying, he will be called the son of the highest or the son of God. The Lord God shall give him the throne of his father, David. Jesus will be the last king in the line of David. And then we get to verses 33 and 34. Verse 33 reads, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Verse 34 reads, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Okay, he's going to reign over the house of Jacob. Now, Jacob in the Old Testament is considered as Israel, the name that the nation Israel. And so Mary's, uh, many people question the virgin birth. Uh, you, if you had non-believers, of course, the virgin birth. But they are not the, one, the first one to question it. Mary was the very first one to question a virgin birth by asking Gabriel, how is this possible since I have no, have had not, no sexual relationship with a man? Uh, so she questioned a virgin birth. Now the verse 35 reads, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high, highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now, God is a spirit. Holy Spirit is a spirit. It's not going to overshadow, not going to be a physical overshadowing. It's just going to be done in a spiritual manner in the way the Holy Spirit works. Gabriel's answer to Mary was an indication that Jesus would be both divine, that is of God, and human. Jesus would actually be God in a fleshly body, and he would be called Jesus. But the Greek name for Jesus is Joshua, which means God saves, or more specifically, Yahweh saves. Jesus would be the fulfillment of the Old Testament promise of a coming Savior. And that was Old Testament, basically was mentioned. Uh, the prophets told this message, uh, basically preached this method for years and years, basically hundreds of years. But it originated in Genesis 3rd chapter, verse 15, when God spoke those words. Verse 36 reads, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Now, Gabriel also informed Mary that her cousin. Now, as I said earlier, cousin could mean cousin, it could mean aunt, or it could mean some other relation, but cousin is what they used here. Elizabeth had conceived, that is, her relation, her cousin or aunt or whomever, had conceived a son despite her old age, and she was in her sixth month. 
And verse 7, 30, 37, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Maybe Gabriel told Mary these things so she could realize that nothing is impossible for God. And now we get to our last verse, and it says, a humble response. Verse 38, and it reads, and Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now, once Mary heard all these, all that the angel had to say to her, she believed him because she told him uh, that, uh, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto thee according to thy words, that she was going to do exactly what he had said. She and the, the she was basically the handmaid of the Lord, and he and she would be as she was instructed, she would do as she was instructed is of what Gabriel had told her. Mary knew that having a child out of wedlock had many consequences and troubles she would have to face. Now, let me repeat possible concerns Mary may have had concerning having a baby and not fully married, as I mentioned in the introduction. First of all, she was very concerned how she could explain this to Joseph the man she was a spouse to, and what others would say because she knew this would pose a very disgraceful critical problem if an unmarried woman became pregnant, the only conclusion that would be that would be that she was immoral and should be stoned to death as prescribed by Jewish law. So she was aware of all of these things. If she was an unmarried woman and she became pregnant, she knew she was going to, couldn't, she was trying to figure out how she was going to explain to Joseph, first of all. Now, if she were to claim her innocence by saying she was a virgin whose pregnancy was caused by the Holy Spirit, the charges of lying, insanity, and heresy could be added to what she said. Now, we know that when people see, even today, people see someone pregnant, they don't ask any questions, they just make assumptions. And that's what, what people would be doing, what people did during that time, including the, the Jewish leaders. Now, people would judge her, but she could not defend herself because if she said the child she was carrying was from God, she would be labeled a liar and could also be tried for heresy. So Mary had faced a, a very serious problem, but she realized those things before she said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be as it did. She would do whatever the angel said. Now, despite all this, as I said, she told Gabriel that she would accept everything he had said and would do as she was instructed. Her faith indicated that she accepted that nothing is impossible for God. And this may, be, may have convinced her that everything would be all right. But the Bible says that she decided to visit her cousin Elizabeth that is, as I said, could be the other relatives, mother than cousin. Uh, shortly after this encounter with Gabriel, perhaps she needed some confirmation of everything because Gabriel told her that her is Elizabeth was uh, pregnant six months with uh, John the Baptist. And maybe she needed a friend to talk to about all that happened to her. Now we read in the scripture, it says that when she went to visit him, and when she walked into the house, Elizabeth said that the, John the Baptist leaped in, his, in her womb. And when she saw, when, when the, the, they, he felt the presence of Jesus in Mary's womb. So that, my Christian friends, is the essence of the Sunday school lesson for this week. Let us close in prayer. Lord, I thank you. I praise you. And I ask a blessing, as I always do, for those that are listening. I thank you for those that are listening. And Lord, help those to understand everything that gets in the Holy Spirit, to, if they have questions about things, to help them to understand it. all of the words that we've said, because this is basically the culmination of what you said back in Genesis, it is a culmination of the, what the prophets said, they preached about, the message they had. And John the Baptist was the one last prophet to proclaim that the Messiah had come. Thank you, Lord, for those things that you've made known to each and every one of us and continue to go with us and help us through these series to understand why you did what you did with Jesus coming to the world and what we should do now that we know that Jesus, why Jesus came. 
into the world. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.